Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Supporters say passing Seattle's new transportation levy is a matter of life or death when it comes to road safety. But opponents are balking at the record-sized $1.55 billion price tag. Advocates say passing Prop 1 would start Seattle down a path towards some overdue road maintenance. A quarter of the city's streets don't even have sidewalks. About 61% of our streets are not accessible if you are disabled and not in a car. From new sidewalks to road repaving and bridge repair, supporters like Cecilia Black of Disability Rights Washington say the levy, which provides 30% of Seattle's transportation budget, is a boost for mobility, safety, and sustainability. This levy really is a balance between all of the the huge needs that we place in our transportation system. It's a bad deal for Seattle. Opponents, like the city council's former transportation chair, Alex Peterson, point out this is the largest levy in Seattle's history at just over one and a half billion dollars. That's $21 more per month for owners of a median priced home. A property tax hike, the no side says, would especially hurt those in need. Let's reject it and, and redo it so that it can become a more affordable, equitable, effective measure. Will Seattle voters say yes to a bigger investment in transportation or put the brakes on what some call a pricey proposition? This is the investment that we need at this moment. Our studio panel weighs in. The proposal would also be the largest property tax increase in Seattle history. We're looking both ways at the Seattle transportation levy next on City Inside Out. Thank you once again for joining me here on City Inside Out. I'm Brian Callanan, and I have with me two people with some different opinions about the transportation levy that's on the ballot for Seattle voters this fall. First, we have Kirk Hoventrotter. He is executive director of Transportation Choices Coalition, an advocacy nonprofit speaking in favor of this measure. Kirk, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. You bet. Also, we have with us Charles Prestrude, director of the Coles Center for Transportation at Washington Policy Center. The WPC is nonpartisan, hasn't taken an official stance on this levy, Charles is here as a voice of concern, and I thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Kirk, can I get an overview of why you support Prop 1, an opening statement, if you will? Keep it to about a minute or so. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. For 18 years, Seattle voters have voted to invest in our streets, our trails, and our transit. Uh, with the Bridging the Gap levy in 2006 and the Move Seattle levy in 2015, they've made investments to make Seattle a more accessible, inclusive city and make sure our bridges work for everyone. And this November, they're going to have a chance to continue to build on that with the Seattle Proposition 1. This is a $1.55 billion levy that is going to meet the needs that we need for our streets in Seattle and make it easier to get around. Okay. It invests in our bridges and our roadways. It is the largest investment in uh, traffic safety, is the largest investment in bikes we've ever had. It invests $151 million to make our buses run more quickly. Okay. It's a generational investment in our sidewalk network, and it's going to transform the way we get around Seattle. Okay, thank you very much for that. We're going to break down those issues for sure here. But Charles, if you could summarize your concerns for us here, if I can ask you that and give, us, give you about a minute. Thanks. Uh, Seattle definitely does need to invest in its transportation system, but the levy doesn't do enough to fix the city's streets and bridges. Uh, the proposal would also be the largest property tax increase in Seattle history, and that is going to make housing more expensive, it's going to raise the cost of living, but at the end of the eight years, it does so little for our streets that they'll actually be in worse condition than they are today. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement in this levy so that it more effectively addresses the city's real transportation priorities. Okay, thank you for that. And Kirk, I'm going to go back to you and talk about the cost of Proposition 1 because a lot of people have been talking about this. As you mentioned, $1.55 billion. It would be the largest levy in city history if it passes. So the cost is going from about two seventy-five per year for the owner of a median-priced home to about 500 a year, an increase of $21 per month. Opponents would say it's simply too much for property owners. It makes housing less affordable in our region. How do you respond to that? 
One, this is the investment that we need at this moment. Seattle has a great need to invest in our transportation system, as Charles mentioned. And our bridges are well over 100 years old. Our roadways, we know, are potholes. Our bike lanes are not as safe as we want to. And people are stuck in traffic on buses getting to where they need to go. This is the investment that's going to meet the need uh, for our growing city. And it is the right investment for the moment. Uh, I think it, uh, for a uh, median household, it is an increase, but transportation is the second largest household cost that we have here in Seattle. And if AAA Washington estimates that's about $12,000 a year that someone has to spend for the cost of car ownership. Mm. The fastest way we can put $12,000 back into someone's pocket is to make it easier to live with one fewer car or without a car. And this levy is going to help Seattleites do that. All right. Thank you for that. Charles, let me kind of come back on this point with you. Uh, the point I've heard from some Prop 1 supporters is the whole idea of these projects aren't going to get less expensive in the years ahead. Adjusted for inflation, we got this new levy. It costs about 30 percent more than the old levy. And some proponents were actually pushing to raise even more with this levy before it was approved because the need is so great. Talk to me about this idea that we're in this moment now. We have some financial urgency to pass a measure like this. Some thoughts? Well, I think there's some truth to that, that projects will get more expensive when they're put off. And in fact, when you uh, allow streets to deteriorate to the point where they have to be fully rebuilt, it costs about five times as much as when you keep up with maintenance and do repaving. But that's one of the problems with this levy is that the city has more than 3,900 lane miles of streets, but over eight years, it only repaves about 500 miles. That's less than 2% a year. And so the condition of the streets is actually going to get worse. So the argument for invest now to save money later is certainly valid, but it suggests that more money needs to be spent on street repair and less on some of the peripheral investments that this levy has been loaded up with. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of these investments, if I could. And Charles, maybe I'll start with you here. I want to talk about what Prop 1 would do if it passes here. Mm -hmm. It would put about $400 million into road maintenance, $221 million into bridge maintenance, about $200 million into pedestrian safety, a host of other priorities. I know the mayor and the council have described this as having something for everyone here, but it sounds like you're saying it's spread too thin. What, what's your point you're trying to make here? I, I believe it is, and it includes things that really don't do much for the transportation system, spends tens of million dollars on undefined climate projects. Mm -hmm. Are they effective? What do they do? I don't know. It also spends money on trees. Well, I'm, I'm a tree hugger. I love trees. But that's the kind of thing that should be funded out of the city's parks budget. Uh, they've added in a lot of things that really don't belong in a transportation levy. They need to focus on the priorities. And it looks like they had a hard time doing that. Uh, Kirk, some thoughts about this. I, I know that Charles wrote a piece for the WPC that said Seattle residents should expect pavement conditions to be worse at the end of the eight-year levy and then today. And you brought that up today as well. I wanted to talk about this. The levy investments haven't been able to keep up with road maintenance needs of the city and this idea that maybe this is spread out too thin, too. Yeah, I absolutely, I think we don't catch up with them by voting no on this levy. The way we do that is by making this investment. And not only does this make a generational investment in our roadways and bridges, it makes a generational investment in sidewalks to help people get around our communities for people who have a disability or for people to be able to walk to our brand new light rail stations that we have in Seattle. Mm -hmm. This also makes the largest investment that we've ever seen in bikes. It's a huge, uh, the largest investment we've ever had in transportation equity investments and also spends to speed up our buses that are stuck in traffic. And for uh, everyone, our transit, our bikes, uh, people getting around, our ambulances, they all rely on our arterials and our bridges. And this is going to make sure that they work for our city okay. for years to come. Charles, can I jump back to you on a point that Kirk made earlier about this idea when a levy like this, if it passes, invests in many different options, making it easier to bike, use transit, things of that nature. That could potentially reduce costs for the average family because they spend so much on transportation. Do you have some thoughts about that? Well, it would be wonderful if it worked that way, but over the course of the eight years, the average household is going to spend more than $4,000 on this levy, but I think a lot of those households will see very little benefit from it, and it would be nice if uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on bike lanes increased the number of cyclists, but I haven't seen any evidence that it's actually going to do that. I mean, it will make it easier for the people who already bike, but that's only a very small percentage of the total people who commute and travel around the city. Okay. 
uh, a rejoinder there, if you wouldn't mind, some thoughts about what uh, Charles has just said. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is an investment that is going to respond to how people want to get around our city, no matter how you get around. And it's going to make it easier to reach the opportunities that we have here. Uh, I just think back to before the last levy passed. There's so many investments now from that levy that we take for granted, that we get so much joy from. The Westlake Trail, where you see so many people jogging, the path around Green Lake. These investments bring people joy, they help people get around, they allow people to get to work easily. And we're gonna see another incredible amount of investments in this levy over the next eight years across the city and make it easier to get to places like our new light rail station. Okay, maybe I can stick with you to talk about one major issue Seattleites are definitely concerned about, safety for pedestrians, for drivers, people with disabilities, everybody out there. Council Member Morales pointed this out a few months ago on the Seattle City Council. Traffic deaths in Seattle are at record highs. Stats from 2022 show a 32% increase in serious injury and fatal collisions in Seattle compared to 2019. Do you feel confident that the investments of this levy, if it passes, will bring those numbers down? I do, Brian. One, we know that the numbers of our friends, our family members, our neighbors who are being killed or seriously injured on Seattle streets are going the wrong way. Every one of those is a tragedy. This levy invests over $100 million in Vision Zero projects, these projects that work to make our most busy, dangerous intersections safer for people walking, especially for kids getting to school. And this levy doesn't shy away from tackling some of our most dangerous, biggest roadways. It makes investments in Aurora Avenue and in the northern end of Rainier and Henderson, these roadways that we know that too many of our family members and friends have gotten hit or killed in a car crash while walking or biking or driving. Mm -hmm. And this is going to work to revamp those streets to make them safer for our neighbors. Can I, uh, did you have a thought? Well, yeah, I did. Um, no one, of course, can oppose improved safety. Mm -hmm. And there is a need to make the transportation system safer. But when you look at the statistics, what you see is that most of the fatalities and serious accidents are due to driver behavior. It's people who are impaired, they're texting, they're talking on the phone, uh, they're driving 80 miles an hour on a city street. Mm -hmm. And the levy doesn't do anything about those fundamental causes of most of the accidents. It isn't to say we shouldn't be looking for ways that we can improve the safety of our transportation system, but we need to acknowledge that the levy isn't really going to address most of the fundamental problems. Kurt, you want to reply? I would, yeah. I would disagree. This levy has a commitment to fill <laughs> potholes within 72 hours. Not only is that going to make it a smoother ride for people around our city and respond to complaints that residents have, but if you're on a bike, you're getting around, and you have to swerve around a pothole, that is, can be concerning, and this is going to pave over those, make it safer to get around our city in whatever way that you get around, and it's an urgent need, and this levy meets the moment. Yeah, and I guess, Charles, I just wanted to touch on one more piece here, because we talked to, to a few disability rights activists mm -hmm. about what was going on here. They're very much in support of this, because they're telling me a lot of these things we're talking about, sidewalks, et cetera, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a matter of life or death in some cases. Oh, yeah. and I, I, I just wanted to make sure I incorporated that vision part of it, or that piece of it, too, because I, I think that's a piece that can't be overlooked here. Uh, that's a very fair point, and uh, the city does need to do more. Part of the reason that it's in the difficult situation it is now is because it hasn't done enough to maintain its sidewalks and crosswalks for decades. Okay, so. I, and, and let me, it, I can, I just want to jump back to you, or did you have a point you wanted to yeah, make? Yeah, I mean, and that's why I'm so excited about this levy, and a coalition is so excited from, about this levy, from the Chamber to Seattle Neighborhood Greenways to Disability Rights Washington uh, to MLK Labor, is because it makes a generational investment in sidewalks. Too much of our city doesn't have sidewalks to connect it to business centers or to their neighbors, and this is going to build over 250 blocks of sidewalks in the first four years of this levy takes what we had committed to building sidewalks in the last levy and front loads that to really meet this safety crisis. Okay. It, I'm going to imagine that you're saying it's not going to do enough sidewalks because I've heard that criticism, certainly. Sidewalks are nice, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to remember that uh, it's the roads that have the biggest funding deficit and that present the largest uh, problem in terms of safety. So uh, 
again, it's a question of priorities, how much you want to spend on each thing. All right. Uh, Charles, I want to talk with you, if I could, about transportation funding options, because that's really at the root of what we're discussing here. Former council member Alex Peterson says instead of leaning so hard on property taxes, the city should consider transportation impact fees. Dozens of other cities in Washington use them, Everett, Bellevue, Shoreline, to name a few. This is where developers pay a fee when they build with money going towards sidewalks, roads, other infrastructure improvements. Is that a funding model you support? I just wanted to make sure I brought this up. It depends on how the impact fees are structured. Uh, the Growth Management Act does uh, empower cities to uh, impose impact fees. The trick is to make sure that the funds that are raised actually address the impacts of the specific proposal that's being built. Okay, and, and I guess maybe, Kirk, if I can draw you in here, I think this really gets to one of the fundamental critiques of Prop 1. The higher you push property tax measures, the more you pile onto our state's infamous regressive tax structure here. And I know the council has talked about these impact fees for the past couple of years, but has not moved on them. Do you think the city should be looking for other ways to fund its transportation priorities? I think, one, we've shown that over the last 18 years, this levy and how it's funded can produce results. I mean, just this year, we've seen the Rapid Ride G line open in the Madison neighborhood that provides frequent bus service to folks. We've seen uh, projects throughout the city get delivered. And this levy is doing that. And the past levies have done that. This levy also has exemptions for uh, people who are struggling to pay their property tax bill. And I'd encourage anyone to look into this. And once again, this is the levy that has delivered uh, over the last 18 years, and this is going to continue to do that. I just want to make sure I draw you in, Charles. Have you seen these past levies deliver? I wanted to ask that question. Well, it depends on who you ask. Okay. Uh, some of the projects were delayed, uh, came in over budget. Uh, I wouldn't say they were batting a 1,000 on that by any means. Uh, as far as funding, one of the things that this uh, new levy would fund is uh, millions of dollars for electric field coal charging stations. Yes. Well, there's a federal program, a $5 billion federal program to pay for electric vehicle charging systems. So <clears throat> why should Seattle city taxpayers get stuck with that bill when there's a federal program to pay for it, or at least 80% of the cost? Okay. Uh, and there are other things in this, this levy that they may be nice things for the city to do, but I'm not sure that they belong in a transportation levy, and I'm not sure that they justify the big increase in property taxes. Can we touch on that EV part real quick? Because I just want to make sure you answer that directly. Yeah, absolutely. In Seattle, over 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. The vast majority of that is people driving alone in their cars. We can provide ways for people to get around using transit, uh, walking uh, through these new sidewalk connections, biking through new bike connections. That's going to provide a way for people to get around without contributing to the climate crisis. And this meets that need. Why not use the federal dollars, I think, is, is Charles's point here. Some thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing I'm the most excited about is how this is going to help people get around in a different way. That generational investment in sidewalks, the transit uh, spot improvements that are going to get our buses out of traffic and jump the line to get bus riders where they need to go. Okay. It's going to help make it easier to get around by walking, biking, and transit in Seattle. Okay. Uh, you had, had something else. Well, one of the other things that this levy does is it does spend a lot on transit improvements, and there is room for improvement there. But the question I would ask is, we already have two transit agencies, Sound Transit that has a budget over $2 billion a year, and King County Metro that has a budget of about a billion dollars a year. Shouldn't they be paying for transit improvements um, instead of sticking it to Seattle taxpayers? Uh, I, I know city and county uh, uh, kick into these different issues sometimes. Yeah. Some thoughts about that? Is this uh, levy in some ways duplicative of other, res of other uh, investments that are being made locally? Yeah, I think the city of Seattle, we own our roadways that our buses run on. And we saw when the West Seattle Bridge broke down what that meant for the West Seattle community and West Seattle transit riders. We need to make sure that our bridges and our roadways are working for our buses, people on bikes, our ambulances, our workers getting around and make sure that neighborhoods like West Seattle never become an island again. <laughs> Imagine if the Ballard Bridge uh, 
did close down, what that would mean for Rapid ID riders, or if the Fremont Bridge went down, what that would mean for people biking across it. Yeah, I, both Charles and I are from West Seattle, so uh, <laughs> we know it well. We know it well. Uh, Kirk, I want to stick back to you and talk about uh, just who is supporting this measure uh, politically and financially. Councilmember Peterson brought up some concerns about this. He points to a number of wealthy donors from outside Seattle donating to the Yes campaign, keep Seattle moving, and trying to influence this race. How do you respond to that critique about who's supporting this campaign? Yeah, I'm proud of our coalition. Uh, the organizations that have endorsed this, not only Transportation Choices Coalition, but we also have Disability Rights Washington, Cascade Bike Club, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, the Downtown Seattle Association, the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, 350 Seattle, and the list goes on. There's so many people who see this as vital to making our city uh, a more accessible and inclusive place, a, more, a place that addresses the climate crisis, and that's why they've signed on to endorse this. Okay. Uh, Charles, I guess on the flip side here, there really isn't a substantial organized no campaign. We've heard a lot from Councilmember Peterson, former mm -hmm. Councilmember Peterson, for sure. Uh, the coalition supporting levy, you've heard, made up of a lot of different voices, business, labor, environmental advocates, too. What do you make of that broad support, and why do you think there's no organized no campaign for this measure? Well, as you know, the uh, political calendar has been kind of busy this year. Mm -hmm. True and, story. And, uh, you know, a levy proposal isn't in the headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think most people are, are really uh, attuned to how much it's going to cost them or what it's going to do. Mm. Uh, so I, I hope they'll read the voters' pamphlet and give it serious consideration and uh, decide for themselves whether the high cost is worth it and whether it delivers the benefits for them. You, you feel like it's going to get lost in the shuffle a little bit here? It's, it's a long ballot we're going to have. Yeah. Okay. As, any thoughts there? Why I encourage voters to start at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I, also want to highlight that this levy funds about 30% of the Seattle Department of Re Transportation's revenue. And if we don't have that, that is a huge chunk that we're going to be missing that makes our roads, our bridges, our bike lanes, our transit system work. I had some thoughts about that 30%. I know this is something always brought up by the levy. This makes up a big portion of, of SDOT's budget here, and to take it away, could have some, some really big impacts. Any thoughts about that? Well, it doesn't really take it away. It's a question of how much it adds. Mm. And we need to keep in mind that the city of Seattle has a very large general fund budget that they could use to fund many of these things. And in fact, there's a good argument to be made that they should be funding some of these things like the street trees and mm -hmm. the electric vehicle charging and some of the other kind of ill-defined placemaking improvements, lighting and so on, that are in the levy. Um, those are things that shouldn't you shouldn't have to fund through a transportation levy and a property tax. They should be funded out of the city's general fund revenues. A, a quick thought on that about how the levy's being used here uh, and what Charles said. Yeah, I mean, I think Seattle voters want to be able to get around by walking, biking. They want easier ways to enjoy this beautiful city, to see our waterfront, to go watch the Kraken and the Mariners, to be able to get to work without being stuck in traffic, and they want to invest in this. Okay. And since the last time we passed the levy, over 100,000 new residents have joined our city. It's going to be the first time that they get to vote to speed up their bus, get to vote to build a new bike lane, get to vote to support the bridge they rely on every day. Okay. Thank you for that. Charles, I wanted to ask a question about this. I know you've raised some concerns about a, what a yes vote would mean. Let's say that happens. How would that impact Seattle? Well, it's a good question. Uh, it isn't obvious that it's actually going to reduce congestion. It will do some good things for street maintenance and bridge maintenance uh, and sidewalks. Those are, those are good things. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the eight years, the city streets are going to be in worse condition than they are today, and I think that's a serious problem. Okay. Uh, I'll flip the question to you, Kirk. Let's say voters say no to Prop 1. What does that do to the city? Like I said, it will cut 30% of the Seattle Department of Transportation's budget. It's going to leave us with bridges that are going to be more vulnerable, more potholes, and uh, unsafe bike lanes and slower transit. And as we welcome the world in 2026 for the World Cup, this is a moment for us to be able to make sure that our city works for our residents and is a welcoming place for the world. Got it. And just uh, briefly, go ahead. <clears throat> well, I certainly hope the city looks good during the World Cup, but uh, most of the improvements wouldn't even get made in time for that. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, it, it's really questionable whether these improvements will improve transit on time performance significantly. Um, so that shouldn't be the main determinant in, in people voting on this.
Uh, Kirk, a quick reply, please. I'd, I'd say ask a lot of the trans riders who are getting to benefit from the new Rapid Ride G bus lanes of how that's changed how they get from First Hill or Madison Valley around the city. These are investments that work and speed people to get to where they want to go. Okay. All right. We're just about time here. Uh, we just have about enough time to get in a, a final statement here if we could. I wanted to get some final thoughts to voters who are looking at this, the transportation levy prop one. If you could keep it to about a minute or so, Kirk, that'd be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I One, Seattle voters for 18 years have invested in our streets, trails, and our transit to build a more welcoming, accessible, inclusive city. And this is a moment to continue to do that, to address the climate crisis, to make it easier to access opportunity. And this is a levy that makes a generational investment in our sidewalks. It makes a huge investment in our transit system to connect us to our new light rail stations. Mm -hmm. And I think voters are excited to do that. And we have a huge coalition from the Seattle Chamber of Commerce to Martin Luther King Jr. Labor Council to Seattle Neighborhood Greenways and Disability Rights Washington who support this uh, and want to get this done. So I hope Seattle voters vote yes on this and invest in our beautiful city. All right, uh, Charles, I'll give you the last word. If you could keep it to just about a minute, that'd be helpful. Sure. The question I would pose to the city council is, if the voters turn this down, can you go back to the drawing board and come up with something that's better, uh, that focuses more on the highest priorities? Uh, I, I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement there. And uh, I also am concerned about the impact on housing costs and rents because that one and a half billion dollars is going to fall on people who own houses, who run small businesses, and who pay rent every month. All right. A lot of concerns here brought up. I appreciate both of your inputs here. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about Seattle's transportation levy? One person writes, the SDOT transportation levy gets bigger every time it comes up, and our roads get worse and worse. Another person comments, we are way behind on road maintenance. $1.5 billion is nothing compared to the inflationary costs of waiting. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on social media. Great to have that feedback, Kirk and Charles. Thank you very much for being here, and we will see you next time on City Inside Out.